We appreciate that you have taken the time to be together with us here at the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo. Special thanks to those of you that came a long way to be part of our 40th anniversary. We are grateful for the partnership and cooperation that we have with you. We have deep respect for the work you do, often in difficult circumstances. The partnerships with some of the organizations represented here today go a long way back in time. We have learned together that promoting human rights is a long-term effort. There may be periods of rapid progress. However, progress may also be followed by periods of stagnation and even setbacks. We think that the topics we will discuss today are of paramount importance for the struggle for human rights and for the fight against corruption and other economic crimes, which in authoritarian states often results in human rights violations. We think that there is a strong need to galvanize more support in democratic and human rights friendly states to courageous whistleblowers and to human rights activists. We should not forget that the Helsinki movement that we belong to is among the most influential movements for human rights in world history. It played a crucial role in creating the conditions for the democratic revolutions that took place in Central and Eastern Europe around 1990 and has been influential in the time after in promoting rule of law and respect for human rights and democratic principles. Now is the time we realize to launch measures that will strengthen the so-called Helsinki effect. The hearing today is part of our celebration of 40 years of struggle to promote human rights, fundamental freedoms, rule of law and democratic governance throughout Europe and also Central Asia. As part of the celebration, we do present an exhibition outside the Oslo City Hall that we opened this Monday in the presence of His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince. The exhibition reflects 40 years continuous work together with partners in Europe and former Soviet countries. As you will see when watching the exhibition, many of those we work together with are women. We think that it's important that the human rights movement it's not only talking about the rights of women, but that it also provides a good model on the role of women for societies that are often dominated by men. Looking back on our history, we noticed that women played important parts. Some of them were among the most vocal voices for democracy, human rights and decency in their societies. As you also will see from the exhibition, they engage in issues that might bring with it strong negative reactions, such as promoting the rights of sexual minorities. Some of the women we portray in the exhibition paid a high price for their work. On this background, we want to see this hearing as promoting strengthened efforts to ensure that in the future, there will be no more attacks on or killings of human rights defenders or journalists. We hope there will be many who take up the heritage of Anna Politkovskaya and of Natalia Estimirova in exposing human rights violations, but they should not have to pay the price that they did. Even though there currently are setbacks in some European countries, we should not at all feel defeated. Overall, if we take the longer view, there has been progress when it comes to respect for human rights and democratic principles. Civil society it's, is much stronger and active today than during communist rule. However, during the last decade or so, we have seen old authoritarian practices being on the rise. I think we can see today that there were important missing points in efforts to promote human rights from the start of the 1990s. We were too optimistic at that time in thinking that progress on human rights and democracy was inevitable. We overlooked impediments or did not give enough considerations on how to overcome them. 
The Magnitsky Act has been called the missing part of the Helsinki movement. I think this is a valid point. The Helsinki movement is, among other things, about ensuring accountability for human rights violations and furthering the notion that civil society should be free to expose wrongdoing by authorities. However, rule of law issues, accountability, and the rights of civil society to challenge authorities were often not given sufficient attention in the states that were in transition to democracy. Today, we realize that we have to make renewed efforts to remedy the near total impunity for officials that violate human rights in many authoritarian states. We must ensure that human rights violators face real consequences. When Council of Europe and UN human rights bodies find states in violation of human rights, sometimes compensation are paid to the victims. However, those responsible for the violations risk little. This is a situation that we think Magnitsky sanctions will contribute to ending. We see such sanctions as a way democratic and human rights friendly states can strengthen and supplement the work of international human rights bodies. We are convinced that denying visa and freezing assets belonging to human rights violators can be effective as a way of denying impunity and preventing further violations. An official that planned to order the silencing of a whistleblower or a human rights defender may think twice when knowing that his or her using of credit cards, travel options, and exercising ownership of assets placed in foreign countries may be seriously restricted. There might be other effective tools, but we are convinced that Magnitsky sanctions belong to the future arsenal of tools for effective promotion of human rights and fighting against corruption. We choose to organize this event as a hearing, meaning that we will hear viewpoints and arguments based on thorough documentation. There might be disagreements about facts and policy issues, but we appeal to all of you speakers, members of panels, and participants alike to remain focused on what you believe is the most well-documented and best argued viewpoints. Let me then, well, let me first tell you that there are emergency exits in this room. You may use that door or that door or the main entrance that you all came in through. If a kind of emergency should occur, we will all meet outside and in the area to the left. And then I would very much like to introduce the first speaker today, Mr. Bill Browder, head of the Justice for Sergei Magnitsky campaign. The floor is yours, Bill. Thank you, Bjorn, um, and good to know about the emergency exits. Um, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be um, here um, kicking off this event with you, and uh, I want to thank Bjorn, uh, the, Helsi the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, uh, Gunnar, and various others who have worked so hard on this event and many other events um, to highlight human rights abuse and impunity around the world. Um, eight years ago, I, eight years ago last week, uh, on November 17th, 2009, um, I got a phone call at 7.45 a.m. in London um, to tell me that my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, was dead. Sergei Magnitsky had been arrested about a year before that date um, by a number of Russian police officers who Sergei had implicated in a terrible financial crime against the state of Russia. And instead of rewarding Sergei for his patriotism for exposing corruption, the Russian authorities arrested Sergei, put him in pretrial detention, tortured him for 358 days, and killed him at the age of 37 
on November 16th, 2009. Sergei Magnitsky left a wife and two children. For me, the death of Sergei Magnitsky was a life-changing experience. Sergei Magnitsky would still be alive today if Sergei had not been my lawyer. Sergei Magnitsky um, was killed as my proxy. If they could have killed me, they would have killed me, but they killed him instead. And so it's been my duty to get justice for Sergei Magnitsky, and I've spent the last eight years trying to do that. Initially, I thought that the murder of a lawyer working for a big Western investor um, would have to be punished. This was, there was nothing unknown about his situation, and there was tons of documents outlining what happened to him, who deprived him of medical attention, all the conditions, the, the torturous conditions they put him under, etc., the beatings, etc. Um, but that didn't happen. The Russian authorities circled the wagons and exonerated every single person involved. Vladimir Putin personally got involved in exonerating those people. Um, Vladimir Putin personally got involved in the cover-up of Sergei Magnitsky's murder. And the people who were responsible ended up getting promoted, and some of them even got state honors. And so it became clear that there was no possibility of getting justice inside of Russia. And so I said, let's try to get justice outside of Russia. But how do you get justice outside of Russia for a murder that was committed in Russia? As I started to explore the legal avenues, and I should point out that I'm not a lawyer, um, so I contacted the best lawyers in the world to figure out what tools were available. And what I discovered was that there are no tools available. If a corrupt regime does a terrible crime, like what they did to Sergei Magnitsky, and they choose not to prosecute anybody in that country, when I first started this campaign, there was nothing you could do. The only thing you could do is you could go to your government, go to the US government or the British government or the Norwegian government, and beg them and ask them to denounce this terrible crime. And if you were lucky, they would issue a two-sentence statement in some report saying that they're deeply disappointed with the murder of Sergei Magnitsky or someone else. And for me, the idea that the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky could get away with it and do it with total impunity was just an unacceptable outcome. And if there was no rules in place, there was no laws in place to create consequences, then we needed to create our own rules and our own consequences. And so I looked at the, at the, at the story of Sergei Magnitsky, and this was a story about corruption. Sergei Magnitsky exposed a $230 million theft, and the people who stole that money don't keep that money in Russia. They keep that money in the West, because as easily as they stole it, it could be stolen from them. And so I said to myself, these people who keep their money in the West, they also like love to travel to the West, they send their kids to private schools in the West, they send their girlfriends on shopping trips to the West. We may not have jurisdiction in the West over a murder that's taken place in Russia, but we do have jurisdiction in the West over who travels to our countries and who uses our financial systems. And that was the idea that was the genesis for the Magnitsky Act. And I took this idea first to Washington. I took it to Senator Benjamin Cardin of Maryland and Senator John McCain of Arizona. And I said, can you sanction the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky? And eventually, they put together the Sergei Magnitsky Act. And the Sergei Magnitsky Act caught on like wildfire because it solves a problem that, sort of a modern day problem that maybe didn't exist 50 years ago. 50 years ago, the people who did these terrible atrocities didn't travel to the West, but they do now. And so 
by having their by having a globalized world where people travel, people use the Western banking systems, we now have a, a point of leverage and a tool. And when this vote, when it went for a vote in Washington, it passed the Senate 92 to 4 in November of 2012. It passed the House of Representatives with 89%. And on December 14th, 2012, President Obama signed the Magnitsky Act into law. There are now 44 people on the Magnitsky list in the United States. But it didn't stop there. The um, senators, uh, Cardin and McCain, said to themselves, this is a, a, we've effectively discovered the new technology for dealing with human rights abuses. Why make it exclusive to Russia? Of course, terrible things happen in Russia, but terrible things happen in other countries, in Venezuela and Vietnam and Iran. Why not make it a global piece of legislation? And so, after four years, in December of 2016, uh, President Obama signed into law, which passed unanimously um, in the Senate, the Global Magnitsky Act. And on that same day, I'm proud to say that the Estonian parliament passed into law their version of the Global Magnitsky Act. And then in May of this year, the British parliament passed the Magnitsky Amendment to their criminal finances bill, which allows the British government to freeze the assets of human rights abusers in the UK. And then in, in um, October of this year, Canada passed in their House of Commons 277 to zero, the Canadian Magnitsky Act. And I'm proud to say that um, last week, November 16th, um, on the eighth anniversary of Sergei Magnitsky's murder, the Lithuanian parliament passed 71 to zero, their version of the Magnitsky Act. There are now five countries that have Magnitsky Acts in place. Um, there are a number of other countries where it's upcoming. And my hope is that Sergei Magnitsky's terrible murder um, won't have been, he won't have died in vain he won't have died for nothing, that his name will be connected to a movement, to a consequence that will hopefully save lives in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bill. We have invited three prominent Norwegians to chair the hearing. Frode Elgesem, Brunulf Riesnes, and uh, Gros Gården Fystro. Fro Delgesem and uh, Brynne Friesnes are <clears throat> experienced lawyers who both have been involved in numerous human rights cases. Gros Gården Fystro is a special advisor at Transparency International Norway and knows very well the realities of corruption and the ways to remedy it. I thank you for the attention and now give the floor to the chairing panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the possibility to be here and participate in this hearing and chair this hearing. Um, first of all, we need a panel. I think, so that will be arranged, I hope. So uh, the chairs will come up, and I invite uh, the first panel to come up. Uh, so, but uh, while that's happening, I, I uh, would like to say some introductory words about this hearing. Um, we in the chairing panel regard this as a day of learning and a day of exploring different important issues. We are going to look first into the Magnitsky case and learn more about that. And uh, then we will move on to broader issues concerning the need to protect human rights defenders and whistleblowers and how to improve the protection internationally and nationally. So there will be uh, a day of learning and a day of exploring important issues on different levels. It is topical these days. Uh, quite a few days ago, or just a few days ago, a unanimous resolution was passed in the UN, UN 
uh, uh, improving the protection or uh, uh, evidencing uh, a unanimous uh, wish to improve protection of human rights defenders and, and uh, whistleblowers. And um, that may also be our common basis that there is a need to improve the protection of human rights defenders. Um, I would like to say also by the introductions that uh, my two colleagues at this panel and myself has not worked specifically with the Magnitsky case before. We know it, of course. We have, um, uh, we have watched some of the movies that have been produced, also the critical movies uh, about this case, and also studied other material, of course, but we're also here to learn and to explore and want to contribute to a better understanding. And also to bring this case into the Norwegian debate uh, in a more, uh, in a stronger way than it has been before. So that is our aim of the day. The, the way we want to do this, we want first to, to invite the, the first panel to come up on the stage. Um, so, and on this panel we have uh, first uh, Olesha Schmagen. Is she here, please? Uh, Schmagen is an investigative journalist at the Novoya Gazeta and working on the organized crime and corruption reporting project there. Then we have Anton Pominov, please come to the stage. Uh, Anton Pominov is a director general of Transpar Transparency International Russia. And then Andrei Nakrasov, come to the stage please. Andrei Nakrasov is a filmmaker, a Russian born filmmaker who has uh, uh, presented uh, critical views on this, uh, regarding the story that we just heard Bill Browder present, and uh, we will hear, hear more about that later. Then Vadim Kleiner, please, uh, who is Head of Research uh, at uh, Hermitage Justice for Sergei Magnitsky campaign. And last but not least, Valerie Botchev. Please come to the stage. Valerie Botchev is the Chairman of the Moscow City Public Oversight Commission and member of the Moscow Helsinki Committee as well. <clears throat> so we welcome you all to, this, to, the, to the panel. And, and uh, the way we want to do this uh, in this panel and also in, in, the, in the following panels is that we want to have a first round of presentations where the panelists will be given, will given three or four minutes to present first uh, what their work with the Vanisky case has been so we can place you in the, in the, in the debate on the, on the Magnitsky case. And then your initial views on the basic questions that are set out in the program. And I think, uh, which can be summed up in, in at least two main questions that I think we want to start with, which is how was, this, was the stealing of the $220 million possible? How was it conducted? And what was Magnitsky's role in that? I think that is two key questions that we want you to, to elaborate a little bit on the, in the beginning. And then we will follow up with questions to the different panelists. And by the end, or towards the end of this session, we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. We'll take a few questions and then the panelists will be uh, allowed to, to make some final comments, including also the questions that are relevant to them. So I want to kick off this by saying that, or by asking uh, Ms. Olesa Schmigen to start, Schmigen, sorry, to start by introducing yourself with a few words. Uh, you. Say a little bit about how you worked with the Bengtsky case and, and, and your basic views on these first initial questions, please. Um, okay, uh, if you don't mind, I will speak in Russian because it's more comfortable and we have translators. Um, Меня зовут Олей Шмагун, я работаю в «Новой газете» и в организации «Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project», то есть CRP. Да, я постараюсь говорить помедленнее. Хорошо. Надо сказать, что моя организация в течение очень многих лет работает с делом Макницкого. И, в общем, это произошло довольно давно, прошло уже 8 лет. Но как бы поступает новая информация, мы выпускаем новые расследования. И вот я сейчас скажу пару слов о, ну, о, о той истории, над которой работала я, о последней истории, которую мы выпустили. Собственно, этот материал, над которым мы работали больше года, об одной из, возможно, ключевых фигур в деле Магнитского, 
Это простой корпоративный юрист из России с таким незапоминающимся именем Андрей Павлов. Его нельзя, в общем, назвать фигурой э, очень, э, ну, облеченной властью. Он не э, следователь, не судья, не чиновник, не, не, ну, не человек, который обладает властью по, по роду своей деятельности. Но э, э, в России даже вот такой простой корпоративный юрист может быть фигурой очень влиятельной, если обладает определенными связями. И подобные неформальные связи между э, следователями и вот такими юристами, э, кумовство и неформальные договоренности, они, в общем, разъедают правоохранительную систему России и приводят к таким случаям, как э, смерть Сергея Макницкого. Э, к нам в руки попала личная переписка этого человека, э, из которой, собственно, очень... Э, складывается ясная картина, как работает эта система. И нельзя сказать, что у нас не было каких-то ну, первых этических сомнений о том, можем ли мы работать с личной перепиской человека, потому что, конечно, мы уважаем право на тайну личной переписки. Но а, вот эти неформальные договоренности невозможно отследить по открытым источникам. И поэтому, конечно, мы приняли решение о том, что мы должны делать публикацию, о том, что та информация, которую мы там нашли, она является предметом общественного интереса. Пару очень коротко. Кто такой Андрей Павлов? Мы считаем, что это человек, который стоит за схемой хищения средств из бюджета, о которой, собственно, заявил Сергей Магнитский. Ну, по нашему мнению, он мог, бы, он мог быть мозговым центром. Он прекрасно разбирается в, вот в этих корпоративных схемах, которые, собственно, и позволили украсть деньги из бюджета. Итак, что мы увидели в переписке? Да? Прежде всего, он ведет переписку с как минимум с тремя следователями, которые фигуранты списка Магнитского, которые были задействованы в этих уголовных делах. Это Карпов, Уржумцев и Николай Будила. Я бы хотела чуть подробнее обстановиться на Олеге Уржумцеве. Это следователь, который одновременно расследовал дело о хищениях средств из российского бюджета, по, в общем, о которых говорил фонд Эрмитаж, о которых говорил Сергей Магницкий, и одновременно входил в следственную группу, которая расследовала дело против Сергея Магницкого, из-за которого он, собственно, оказался в тюрьме. И вот этот а, Олег Уржунцев, в общем, находится в довольно тесных отношениях с адвокатом Андреем Павловым. А, он называет его в переписке «квазивеликий», Возможно, в шутку, но в то же время выполняет просьбы и указания, прямые указания Андрея Павлова по уголовным делам, в которых Павлов имеет личную заинтересованность. Например, мы можем отследить, как Павлов просит Уржунцева повлиять на то, какие материалы появятся в уголовном деле уже по расследованию смерти Сергея Магнитского. Это очень сложный клубок уголовных дел. Я понимаю, ну, я надеюсь, что вы какой-то бэкграунд о деле Магнитского имеете. Второй следователь, с которым состоит переписки Павлов, это Карпов. Он, в общем, наверное, самый известный следователь. Он пытался в лондонском суде отстоять свою репутацию, подавал иск о защите чести и достоинства. И вот адвокат Павлов, которого мы считаем человеком, который стоит за хищением средств, он очень активно помогал Карпу в этом деле, в лондонском процессе. И в том числе материально. То есть получается, что человек, который может стоять, который может быть одним из бенефициаров хищения, помогал материально э, следователю как бы отмыть свою репутацию в лондонском суде по этому делу Магнитского. А, и, ну, соответственно, о чем еще стоит сказать? О том, о, о, что о, Павлов припом... ну, то есть продолжает взаимодействовать с этими следователями уже и после дела Магнитского. И о, они... Эти следователи участвуют в расследовании уголовных, других уголовных дел, в которых Павлов имеет прямую заинтересованность. И по этим уголовным делам, собственно, тоже люди оказываются в тюрьме, к юридической стороне этих дел возникает много вопросов, там люди пишут письма в защиту там, экономистов, которые оказываются в тюрьме, и... 
ну, как бы, вот эти, вот эти люди, которые оказались в тюрьме, они не погибли, да, поэтому, наверное, никто из здесь присутствующих не знает имя Александра Волкова, например. А, если вот а, на секунду вернуться к фильму а, Андрея Некрасова, который здесь присутствует, там есть, а, ну, интересный момент, который мне показался, ну, таким интересным. Вот вы, например, говорите, что... Сергей Магнитский не оказался в каких-то особенных условиях. Он был в тюрьме, ну, наравне с остальными ну, заключенными, да, и э, был в тех же условиях, ему не создавали отдельных условий. И вы делаете интересный вывод, что вроде, ну, как мне показалось, может, я не права, что э, это значит, что это нормально, что находиться в пыточных условиях, то есть, как бы, значит, эта смерть не является чем-то таким особенным. Но вы Поправьте меня, если я не права. Я сделала такой вывод из ваших слов. И что мне хочется сказать. Дело Сергея Магнитского не единственное. Сергей Магнитский не единственный, кто оказался в тюрьме по там, ложным обвинениям. Эти же люди продолжают сажать других людей. И вывод, конечно, хочется сделать другой. Это, продолж... это происходило, это происходит и, видимо, будет происходить. И от этого еще более страшно. И в... вот эта система неформальных связей продолжает ломать э, жизни людям. И люди оказываются в тюрьме, э, людей сажают в, пыточ... ну, в... В... Сажают в тюрьму, они оказываются в пыточных условиях, э, потому что они кому-то помешали, перешли дорогу, потому что хотят отжать их бизнес или хотят получить нужные показания на других людей. И это происходит, и их нужно остановить. И я не политик и даже не гражданский активист, поэтому мне сложно сказать, поможет ли акт Магнитского или нужно предпринимать какие-то действия другие. Но я знаю, что этих людей нужно остановить, и я вижу, что правоохранительная система России с этим не справляется. Okay. Thank you very much. It's, uh, that was an interesting start, and I want to, to continue on the general level a little bit with uh, Mr. Anton Pominov from Transparency, Interna Transparency International, because, I mean, there are lots of money involved here, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, one of the issues that is raised by Mr. Uh, Browder is the, the uh, possibility of, of hiding money, and how do you follow the money? And Transparency International worked with this, and can you say a little bit about the general uh, problem about Uh, about the international transa transaction and how they, how, how they hide this money. Um, <clears throat> okay, it works. Uh, I will also be speaking Russian, if you don't mind. Uh, so please use your headphones, those who don't understand. Я буду говорить по-русски. Всем добрый день. Спасибо большое за то, что позвали сегодня выступить здесь, конечно, я думаю, что лучше бы а, здесь присутствовал человек, который, а, собственно, тогда занимался делом Магнитского, Елена Панфилова, но, а, к сожалению, а, у Елены, может быть, к счастью, я не знаю, у нее столько студентов курсовых и дипломных работ, что а, она совершенно не смогла сегодня выбраться, потому что а, очень много дел в университете. Тем не менее, всем привет от нее. Значит, что касается денег по делу Магнитского, то я думаю, что мы лучше этот вопрос адресуем Вадиму Кляйнеру, возможно, который больше знает на эту тему. Но я бы хотел поговорить скорее о том, чем тогда, когда произошло это дело, занималась Transparency International России и роль Transparency International в этом деле. И потом, если останется минута, я поговорю немножко о деньгах. Значит, Панфилова тогда входила в Совет при Президенте по гражданству, по развитию институтов гражданского общества и при, при Медведеве, значит, и вот Совет дал свое заключение по этому делу. И к нему есть одно приложение рабочей группы как раз по тому, что же произошло с юридической и с финансовой точки зрения. Так вот, с моей, как мне кажется, самое интересное там вот что. 
даже не ну, пропыточные условия содержания, это я думаю, что коллеги сейчас расскажут. Вот. А интересно именно а, та ситуация конфликта интересов, когда следователи, которые изначально проводили обыски в Hermitage Capital, вот, и против которых Магнитский написал заявление, потом они же, эти же самые следователи, вели дело Магнитского. Вот. И там один возбуждал, да, Кузнецов, Карпов, Сильченко, там была такая троица. Вот. И э, вот что интересно, что э, вот эта ситуация конфликта интересов так никогда и не была разрешена. И мы в 2011 году говорили, слушайте, э, мы настаиваем на том, что э, это дело должно быть доведено до конца в России, а западные страны э, и международное сообщество могут нам помогать как-то. То, о чем говорил э, Билл, что не было инструментов э, никаких у западных стран повлиять на наших чиновников. И мы говорили, что вообще-то это наш долг э, в России провести полное расследование и показать всему миру, что мы можем это сделать. Но, к сожалению, э, вы знаете, что это так никогда и не произошло, и даже более того, судили самого Сергея Магнитского за то, что он значит, создал схему по выводу налогов. Так вот, проблема на сегодняшний день, с нашей точки зрения, заключается в том, что так никогда ни одного суда по этому делу и не произошло. То есть те документы, которые мы с вами имеем, вот в пяти странах акты Магнитского, это локальное решение проблемы, то есть мы говорим, что люди, которые, которых мы обвиняем в, ну не мы в смысле, а, например, конгрессмены, вот, обвиняют в нарушении прав человека, несут определенные последствия, подвергаются определенным санкциям. Вот с нашей точки зрения, Transparency International Россия этого недостаточно. Чтобы мы хотели в идеале, чтобы коррупция, а ведь, как правильно заметил господин Браудер, именно коррупция лежит в основе этого дела. То есть нарушения прав человека были следствием алчности людей, построивших вот эту схему. Так вот, за, коррупци... за коррупционные преступления мы сейчас не можем с вами судить э, людей, которые нарушили э, законодательство национальное. Э, и если какие-то мелкие чиновники попадают под, э, ну, могут попасть под суд теоретически в странах, где э, существует э, несправедливый суд, да, то, естественно, чиновники высшего уровня или люди, связанные с чиновниками высшего уровня, такие, например, как вот эти замечательные следователи, вот, то им ничего не грозит дома, вот, но, к сожалению, им ничего и не грозит на, э, вот, по международному праву. И с нашей точки зрения это большой пробел, который в течение ближайших, ну, будем говорить, пяти, может быть, десяти лет нам с вами нужно заполнить, и в этом смысле я надеюсь найти в ваших организациях, которые вы представляете, союзников в том, чтобы коррупционные преступления, так же как э, преступления э, против прав человека, э, были, имели свою институцию международную, которую признают множество стран, для того, чтобы этих людей можно было судить. Потому что диктатор захватил власть в своей стране, вы не сможете осудить его там, ну, пока он эту власть не потеряет. Вот, поэтому, с моей точки зрения, локальные акты Магнитского – это локальное решение э, проблемы, вот, но оно трудоемкое, вот, и нам нужно больше, нам нужен, нужна возможность судить э, коррупционеров, особенно grand corruption, большую коррупцию э, э, на международном уровне. Вот, э, ну, что касается вывода денег, то, естественно, схемы, как э, существовали, так и существует. Мы это видим э, на примерах лондрематов. Вот, это то, что ОССРП расследовала. Вот здесь как бы есть, конечно, 
за последние несколько лет много шагов было предпринято по и раскрытию бенефициарных собственников компании. Ну, это огромная отдельная тема. Вот, значит, и, и, и на лондонском саммите в прошлом году страны приняли много обещаний на себя, что мы будем раскрывать бенефициарных собственников компаний, чтобы такие схемы было проще расследовать, и реестры у нас появляются. Вот. Но, тем не менее, все это упирается в то, что вернуть активы, даже те, которые были украдены, можно, опять же, ну, в каком-то правоохранительно-судебном порядке. Вот. А ну, не в парламентском, да, там, не в порядке там, претензий Минюста. Вот. Поэтому если мы будем говорить о возвращении а, активов, а, украденных из российского бюджета, то, ну, как бы, то здесь либо Россия должна быть вовлечена, либо некая международная институция, о которой мы пока мечтаем на уровне концепции в Transparency International России, который позволило бы, и которую, естественно, страны, больше и больше стран будет признавать, которая могла бы быть использована для замораживания и возвращения таких активов. Окей, спасибо большое. Я думаю, мы поговорим об этом позже, и мы вернемся к этому в следующем панели. Это время поговорить немного о кейсе Магнитского. Мистер Браудер представил salient details of the, of the case, uh, and uh, we want to uh, ask Mr. Nekrasov, who has mm -hmm. uh, made the yeah. film about this, which is a film about a film, and a film about an investigation, actually. And, and could you please, in, in, in uh, a short, it's, it's a two hour long film, so, so it, it's hard to ask you about <laughs> doing this in four minutes, but could you short briefly set out the main, yeah. the main points that you make in your film and, and the main uh, yeah. criticism against the, the, the Magnitsky campaign? Yeah, well, but that's pre precisely the problem, is that uh, um, I think about nine o'clock p.m. yesterday, last night, I got uh, uh, an email. I don't know when it, exactly when it was sent, but that's when I got it um, on the way here, uh, uh, suggesting, inviting me to, to, to have a PowerPoint presentation, if I've got one, and, and sending me this um, uh, from the Norwegian Health, Norwegian Health Committee and sending me this um, uh, document, which is basically a rebuttal of, of the statements uh, distributed to the uh, audiences here in the statements uh, allegedly made in my film. And uh, I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation. I didn't know that there was, would be an opportunity. But uh, anyway, I'm a film director, so my, my PowerPoint presentation is, is actually my uh, film. Or uh, some people do uh, say it's powerful, despite of all the... Uh, all the massive campaign. You know, it's actually, even with all the pressure from uh, Bill Browder and, uh, and his colleagues, um, the, the film got uh, prizes and a lot of uh, praise. Got prizes at, at when the situation is really independent, for example, at the Prix Europa, at the all European uh, um, uh, media competition. It's it's got uh, it's, it came second, uh, which is you know out of many 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 entries with, and I got a prize in Paris, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, so some people will think it's powerful, but I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So the problem is that um, uh, uh, I n not only I disagree with with the facts in this um, rebuttal, I disagree with the statements made on behalf of my film. So. We're a bit, uh, and, and film is not being shown, so we're a bit in the circular logic. And I'm just wondering, um, who, who wrote this document? I mean, uh, gonna, is it you, or you know, because it's it, it's kind of anonymous. It says that it comes from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. It, it reminds me of, basically, it goes back to Mr. Browder's sources. So, um, and maybe he wouldn't even deny it. Uh, but the problem is. Um, you know, there are lots. Of, there's a huge list of problems, and you know, obviously, I'm given five minutes. And let's not be, let's not pretend. It would be a bit disingenuous to pretend that uh, we're kind of in a in a in a balanced, uh, impartial hearing. And that I think was the idea, because I was at the inception of this idea, of uh, and welcomed the idea to have a hearing. 
And we worked on it. We discussed it with the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of uh, NHC and uh, uh, my, my colleagues. And, and it was supposed to be kind of b balanced, like, you know, basically 50-50, because obviously there are two, two conflicting views. There may be more, but so all of those, uh, of the proponents of those views which should be presented in a sort of fair balance. I'm here basically out, outnumbered, frankly, by, by a factor of 10, or, you know, how many, how many speakers? 20. I think all of them, uh, more or less, represent uh, Mr. Browder's version. So I don't think it's a really a fair hearing. But you know, mm. I'll, I, 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 you know, a lot of a lot of my friends said, "Don't go," because this is obviously biased against you. I decided to come. So let's see. Um, I've probably used already, you know, a, a, a third of my time. Uh, but, uh, you know, one more general remark, and then I'll just make a few uh, specific remarks. So, basically, I think we're in a situation where, and I ask Gunnar, um, why is it you rely so heavily on Mr. Browder's version? And he said, yes, he admitted that. He admitted that. But he said, look, uh, what can we do if, if the Russian officials don't investigate the crime? But if you look carefully at that argument, you know, and he, he, he was honest enough to admit it, you know, that this, most of it comes from Mr. Browder, probably Mr. Kleiner, who is actually presented also as, as an independent expert, but is clearly, is clearly a part of Mr. Browder's team. So uh, the problem is that it's, it's a bit like uh, asking uh, somebody, uh, uh, why do you think uh, God exists? He said, because, because the Bible says it exists. And why, why do you believe the Bible? Because the Bible is the God's word. So we're going to the circular argument. I mm. kind of uh, question the very basis of, of this narrative. I don't think, I, I don't think uh, M M M Magnitsky was murdered. I don't think... So, so, uh, so when, you, when you start by saying Russians did not investigate Magnitsky's murder, we're into the circular argument. Mm. Okay, so I also want to stress that I am and I have, have always been, and I am a, 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 a critic of, of Russian government. I am a human rights defender with, with a proven track record. In fact, I think, correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, uh, Bill Browd and Gunnar uh, Iklova-Sudal, is I was, I was uh, uh, making uh, anti-Putin, as they say, put, uh, films, when, when Mr. Browder was defending Putin. I know, uh, when, when uh, Russian, Russian Air Force was bombing uh, Chechen civilians and when, when uh, Yushchenko was poisoned, uh, you know, 2004, uh, when uh, uh, our friend uh, Anna Politkovska was murdered, etc., etc., Mr. Browder was busy uh, defending Putin and, frankly, making money. So, um, so we, we should also be very careful. One, this, this, this document presents me as, as, as a proponent or uh, promoter or something of the Russian, of the Russian version. It does, it does it completely uh, evidence-free because nobody can blame me for defending the Russian government. Uh, okay, so uh, as I said, I disagree with, 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 with all, all of this. I can, I can uh, re refute that uh, these statements actually represent what I'm saying in the film, but I don't have time for that. So um, let's uh, uh, what, just, uh, just take any. Like click, for example, uh, on the page 126. How many of you, by the way, studied all these, uh, all these hyperlinks? Uh, 126, page 126 of this dossier, everybody was supposed to get. Mm -hmm. Magnitsky's investigation and preparation of the complaint filed, you know, and then English, Russian, English, Russian, on the 23rd of July 2008, about the theft of uh, $230 million. Okay, you, you click on, you click, basically it says that Magnitsky investigated and prepared the document. Mm -hmm. You click on it, and there's no trace of Magnitsky. Okay, it's a it's a document prepared, signed by a, a certain Paul Rank. You know, uh, you can you can actually say if you you know if, I, I think if you, if I ask uh, Vadim, he'd probably say, oh, actually, it doesn't say that Magnitsky signed it, right? It says it's investigated and prepared. Fair enough, and that's what I'm saying. So Paul Range signed it, but who, who of you, have, having read that Magnitsky inve Magnitsky's investigation and preparation of the complaint, would have thought that actually uh, 
there's no signature of Magnitsky. Th this statement says that Magnitsky investigated and prepared, not only here, but in uh, anywhere else. There's no evidence, there's no proof Magnitsky investigated anything, investigated this particular crime, at least. And, and, and uh, when uh, you, with uh, due respect, said, I just accidentally heard you saying, uh, Magnitsky написал заявление, Magnitsky wrote a um, application. application or a request complaint. or a complaint, criminal complaint. Well, he did, never did, I'm afraid. He never did, I'm very sorry. He never did. The, 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 the evidence uh, of Mr. Browder and his team presents is uh, for, for Magnitsky having accused the officers are the... the Mr. Mr. Nekrasov, I, yeah. I will be very happy to give you a few more minutes. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, but okay. could you take a step backwards? Because, uh, right. like the panel, many are new to this okay, case. Okay, all right. We like okay. it to, oh, you to see. a little bit okay, I'll, less I'll, detailed, I'll, more basic about all right, okay. how, how okay. is your okay, view I'll be, of the story right. that we just okay, heard from okay, Bill Browder? And, and what, is the, what is the basis well, for, well, for well, your view? Well, you see, but the devil is obviously in the detail. I know that. I know that. Okay. Okay, let's let's just Please. okay. Basically, my cl I claim, and and the, the film explains it very, very, very. Uh, I think very convincingly that Magnitsky wasn't a whistleblower. Magnitsky was an accountant for Mr. Browder. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, there was a long argument whether he was a lawyer. We're not not going to go into it. Uh, but I think it's important not not because of the profession, and uh, we, we we want to somehow denigrate Magnitsky. He wasn't a lawyer. No, but Mr. Browder's version uh, is is also founded on on the on his claim that he hired Magnitsky to investigate s some crime, whereas Magnitsky, I'm, I'm saying he was an accountant, mainly because Magnitsky had been working for Mr. Browder since the 90s and was involved in all these uh, various operations, s s some of which uh, the Russian government convicted Mr. Browder for. Uh, didn't convict, by the way, uh, Mr. Magnitsky, that's another myth, they, they, because they kind of brought it to trial, but they did not convict him. Uh, let me just... Okay, Okay, because, because I'm running out of time. Let me just say uh, this. It's like, uh, the, the important thing, uh, uh, this one, also Gunnar Ekelovic told me, um, okay, it's not just, it's, it, there's a lot of Mr. Brown in our sources, but not only. Okay, fine. There's this big, uh, long re report from the Council of Europe. One can say, okay, not only Mr. Browder, but many international, serious international organizations uh, re re investigated the case. For, uh, for example, um, Andres Gross of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. You know, a, a main human rights body, which is, you know, we're sitting here at a human rights organization, the main, Europe's main human rights body, of which Norway and Russia are members. Okay, fine. Let me just uh, uh, write, read you a quote. A quote from uh, uh, William Pauley, a U.S. District Court federal judge, American judge, not an American journalist, not even an American lawyer, an American judge. And he says this about this report, Andreas Gross report. It's a long text, I'll try to, be, to, 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 to cut the wrong grammar so that it's clear. It, it is in my judgment, suffers from a lack of trustworthiness, having read it, Judge Pauley. Uh, there doesn't appear to have been an actual hearing and we're at a hearing, by the way. So there should have been another hearing in the Council of Europe. There has, hasn't been a hearing, actual hearing, conducted following the dissemination of Gross's report or any drafts of that report. There's no evidence that an actual hearing with an appropriate procedural safeguard was actually conducted. Finally, the inception of this report appears to have pre predicated on a series of events that bring into question certain motivational problems. The Gross report cites earlier work of the Assembly regarding the Magnitsky case. <clears throat> One of the events that may have colored the investigation from the outset is William Browder's interference with the Assembly's work. In June 2011, it appears that Browder made an intervention made an intervention at a parliamentary seminar at a meeting of the committee that ultimately authorised Gross's involvement and in conducting this investigation. Further, the Gross report is replete 
with statements from witnesses that are sympathetic to Magnitsky and Browder, among others. There are several individuals who were paid, who were paid and directed by Hermitage to investigate Magnitsky's related events, who were interviewed by Gross. While Gross, has, while Gross cites certain conversations he had with uh, Russian officials and the documents he received from them, those references are e eclipsed by the statements and opinions by Browder, Hermitage and other self-interested parties. In other words, the Gross report in, is some piece of work which is a very rude American expression. And I mean it, and, and he said, and I mean it, he means that in uh, uh, hyperbole. You know, he says that it, he doesn't mean, he means it as, as it's basically. But the, uh, the so, and, uh, so basically, and I want to, uh, I'd like to end uh, on, on another quotation from uh, a certain Robert Otto, a Russia expert of Bureau of Intelligence and Research of the State Department. Um, um, it, it was, um, he wrote this on June 25th, 2016, by the way, as we were preparing to screen our film at the European Parliament, our, the premiere of our film at the European Parliament, which Mr. Browder successfully stopped through, through his lawyers. He was trying to ban the film. Um, meanwhile, I'm beginning to think that we're all just a part of the Browder PR machine. Quote, here I will just quote from The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. It's a, a 60s Hollywood classic, if you know, John Wayne film. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Nakrasov. And, and, I, and I also, we need to go uh, also more into detail in a specific case and, and, and yeah, also your, the basis. The basis. We want to hear about the basis for your criticism. Not all, yeah. So, so, yeah, and we, we're open to, very open to, to listen to that, and, and uh, we'll return to that. So, mm -hmm. so thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to, to uh, Vadim Kleiner, uh, and um, uh, we heard uh, Mr. Nikasov uh, rebut or uh, challenging uh, Mr. Browder's the story that we heard Mr. Browder tell. Um, uh, and uh, would you please elaborate a little bit what your background for working on the case is and, and uh, your basic points or your basic views on and documentation for the fact or the, the position that, that uh, the, the Russian government was involved in the stealing of the money and, and uh, what was uh, Sergei Magnitsky's role in this. And, and was he, suffered he in prison and was killed because he was a whistleblower? Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. I am very proud to be here at Helsinki Committee. It's such an honorable building. And uh, I am trying to address uh, some of the issues in a short set statement because I have five minutes here. Uh, I'm glad that Mr. Nikrasov didn't touch any factual base, uh, tried to say his opinion on different things. Uh, that's why uh, let me uh, not spend too much time about my background, but I can say that I work for Bill Browder with Bill Browder for the last 20 years uh, as a head of research and last nine years uh, in a justice campaign for Sergei Magnitsky after his murder. Uh, so, uh, given the lack of time, I try to touch only several uh, factual issues uh, which are stated in uh, Mr. Nikrasov's movie, uh, but again, he is not uh, actually the person who devised them, uh, it's a criminal group who uh, made this crime, uh, who set up this uh, kind of fictitious uh, set of events, which uh, Mr. Nikrasov is so much uh, reflecting in his movie. Okay, so uh, issue number one, which I would like to touch today, I'll try to be short because uh, probably Mr. Barshov will be able to say more, uh, but this is the fact uh, whether Sergei Magnitsky was beaten and what's happened with him uh, in prison uh, during the last uh, hours of his death. I don't know how much of you saw these pictures, but any of you who could see these colored pictures has no doubts that the person was beaten. Not only that the person was beaten, but the wrists, which actually looks terrible, shows that he was struggling for his life. And it was almost up to the bones, the wounds which he got in the last 
hours of his life. So there are no doubts that there was a physical uh, violence against him. But since it's a Russian system where everybody is trying to report uh, and share responsibility of even the crimes, there are quite a few documents which were received in the Russian system by the lawyers representing the family. Uh, in front of me is a report of using handcuffs, which is actually uh, signed by one of the uh, top officials of the uh, prison, which confirms uh, that uh, several hours before his uh, death, he was chained. Then there are other documents confirming the fact that, he, uh, that there were special group of enforcement uh, called to go after him. And finally, a report of using uh, rubber truncheons or baton, uh, batons against him. Again, in order to share the responsibility, there are uh, signatures of three persons under this document. This document came from Russian court. Death certificate. When Sergei Magnitsky died, it's supposed to be a hearing in the court. And immediately they send the death certificate, the first version of it. Then they start uh, amending it and amending uh, various reasons of death. But one of the possible reasons of death here was said closed cranio-cerebral injury. So, as a result of beating or any other physical uh, violence with him. Moreover, the first investigator uh, who showed up uh, at the uh, scene uh, actually f uh, filed a report, a report about the crime, Mr. Levin, DA, the report on the crime uh, under, uh, I, I would like to file a crime, uh, a crime envisaged, envisaged by Article 105, Part 4, and Article uh, 111 of criminal, uh, uh, Russian Criminal uh, Code, uh, and reported in a crime uh, register book and performance ex examination. What is these articles are about? It's article about murder. Article 105, it's named very simple, murder. Then we are going to the expert examination of Russian uh, doctors. And we know how much pressure was put by the government of Russian Federation on those doctors. Some of them anonymously called us and because they felt guilty. But even after that, what we are reading in this report, the injuries which Mr. Magnitsky had were caused resultantly from the traumatic application of blunt hard object or objects, which is confirmed by the closed type of trauma and their morphological manifestation in the form of abrasion, eczemas, blood effusions into the soft tissues. The determined mechanism of Mr. Magnitsky's injuries formation does not exclude the possibility that part of these injuries formed based on the traumatic impact of rubber truncheon, which is testified by the following. The injuries are caused through the impact of blunt hard object. The rubber truncheon is such a blunt hard object. Finally, uh, I just mentioned the following fact. Uh, just days before Sergei Magnitsky died, some uh, of the other lawyers involved in, in this uh, uh, investigation, along with Sergei Magnitsky, received an SMS messages with the death threats. First, they considered that it was uh, somehow related to Sergei Magnitsky's potential imprisonment. It was such uh, words there. And it was sent on 23rd of October, which is uh, a uh, couple of weeks before, uh, three weeks before, before his death. Don't know what is more frightening, death or prison. He's going to such a nightmare, to Salikamsk prison. One week before his death. If the history teaches us anything, then anyone could be killed, Michael Carleone. You make your own judgment. Obviously, we are not investigators and we are not able to investigate it further in, Ru in Russia, but we believe that one day it will be investigated and everybody responsible for that will be brought to justice.
The second point which I would like to touch, uh, given uh, the lack of time, is actually uh, another lie which had been disseminated uh, by mainly members of the criminals group and also widely spread in this movie, is the fact that Sergei Magnitsky did not investigate the crime and did not mention uh, the officials involved in it. Uh, especially Pauline was uh, uh, watching the movie and, show, and seeing how uh, different people who doesn't speak Russian been shown the Russian testimony waved in, behind, uh, in front of them, saying that there are no names of police officers here. Yes, indeed, <clears throat> the document which was waived is dated with October 8, 2008. It's a testimony of Mr. Magnitsky. What does it say in its second paragraph from the top. In this connection, I confirm my testimony given on the 5th of June under the case number 374015. Now we are going to this uh, um, testimony which he gave in June. And we made just some statistical analysis. So the name of uh, police officer Artem Kuznetsov is mentioned 15 times. The name of Pavel Karpov, another police officer who traveled together with uh, uh, criminals prior to this crime, uh, mentioned 13 times. Another statement of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Nikrasov that uh, Sergei, Magnitsky, um, Sergei Magnitsky never accused anybody in these testimonies. Let me read you that. So. The aforesaid circumstances are objective evidence that in 2007, three companies, Parfinion, Mahon, and Ryland, with all the assets were misappropriated with the possible use of the materials and information seized during the search under the investigation into the criminal case against other company. The misappropriation was arranged by using forged documents and such and such and such and such. So effectively, he is already talking about the crime in this statement. But he did not stop here. And in his next statement, which I started with in October 2008, he said the following. Uh, so effectively, uh, he's referring to the other attorney who was uh, defending the legal interest of these companies to repeal the court decision issued illegally according to falsified documents and subsequent discovery of embezzlement of budget funds in excess of 5 billion do, uh, rubles, which had obviously been committed by the same group, he is referring to the same people, of persons who had used illegal re-registration of Parfinion, Mahaon, and uh, Ryland and filed claims against those companies as a tool of his embezzlement money from the state registry. Another fabrication which Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Nikrasov made in his movie, he said uh, that effectively these uh, uh, testimonies of Mr. Uh, Magnitsky were done in, inside the case against Mr. Browder and Mr. Magnitsky for stealing the budget money, which is not true. The truth of the matter, which is well known and uh, provided with the documents, there is a uh, mm, complaint which was filed in December uh, 2007, so prior to the money stolen from the budget, that uh, about the stolen companies from Hermitage Fund, as well as mm, uh, fake uh, liabilities uh, made through the uh, court judgment, which were used then for uh, illegal tax rebate as a pretext for the tax rebates. And on the basis of this uh, particular statement uh, filed by uh, one of the officials of HSBC named Paul Range, uh, the criminal case was opened. And Sergei Magnitsky uh, produced his evidence as a representative of Paul Range in the case which was opened on, on the Hermitage and HSBC request. I have uh, dozens of other evidence to show that this, uh, the, the, this uh, film uh, is full of uh, untruth statement, but I have a lack of time. And, Thank and, you. And I just want to ask you one more question, and there will be ample time to, to answer that and reply to that afterwards. So, so no worries about that. Okay, thank you. And, and, uh, but uh, we need to, I mean, uh, it's hard to 
for many people, I think, to follow the, the detailed discussion on, on each uh, element of that film. But uh, it's it's interesting for for those who's into the into the issues. But one short question, from your perspective, why was Magnitsky arrested? Uh, it's a very and good you question. Re Thank you. That afterwards. It's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, the main uh, part of the Sergei's investigation, which happened at this time, uh, was that he found that obviously this enormous crime, and just think about it, the tax rebate was approved in one day. Have you ever, have you, have you ever that heard? That's not true. That is a lie. Okay, so uh, uh, if, if you allow me to finish. Okay, thank you. So One there, time. The, yes, the, the, there is a decision to, tax, to rebate taxes which refer to the request to rebate taxes, and they are dated with the same day. So this, is, this means the same day means one day. So next thing yeah. is you never heard that this type of decision has been made by one day. What does it mean? First of all, it means the complicity of all the officials involved in making this decision. In all the officials who approved this decision on whatever high level of the hierarchy of the Russian tax system. Obviously, it could not be done within, uh, within um, uh, like local of, on, on the local office. All, the, all their names are on the list. But what is more important, Sergei Magnitsky found out that exactly the same crime was done by exactly the same people, including Mr. Pavlov, who was involved in this, including the same tax officials who put their signatures on this document one year before. And he gave an interview anonymously, because he was afraid for his life, to Business Week. Business Week article was published on uh, 5th of November uh, 2008. Two weeks later, he was arrested and died in prison. So, and we believe that this particular finding, that th this was a serial crime, and uh, by the way, colleagues of Olga Shmagun proved that this crime started pro approximately in 2006 and continued uh, up to 10, uh, 2010, when Mr. Magnitsky was already dead of tax rebates, okay. so, and the same, by the same group. So this was the trigger, we believe, for his arrest. Okay, so, so we'll come back to that, but that is the, the main uh, argument or the main, main basis for his, uh, or the reason behind it, the arrest, which, which means that he was arrested for, uh, because someone wanted to protect government other perpetrators. Officials. Government officials who were involved in this crime. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that. And uh, lastly, but not uh, least, on the, on the panel, Mr. Valery Bodchev, who, um, who is chairman of the Moscow City Public Oversight Commission. Um, it was argued that, that, uh, that uh, Sergei Mat uh, Magnitsky was not killed. And uh, that is, uh, was uh, the circle argument uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Nekrasov. What is your comment to that? And can you explain a little bit more about your background first and then, and then uh, your insight in, in the treatment of Mr. Magnitsky in the prison? Да, да. Спасибо. Общественная наблюдательная комиссия по соблюдению прав человека и места предупреждения содержания города Москвы, она действует в соответствии со специальным законом номер 76. Мы пришли на третий день после смерти Магнитского Бутырку. В группу входило шесть человек. Это вот я как председатель, Волкова Любовь Васильевна, заместитель, Альперн Людмила Ильинична, Зоя Светова и Лидия Борисовна Дубикова. А, еще Флерова. Расследование участвовали, мы беседовали, был генерал Давыдов, начальник УФСИН, начальник э, тюрьмы Комнов, э, и э, потом продолжалось еще, еще длительное время. Господин Некрасов сказал, что э, он не думает, что убили Магнитского. Тем не менее, документы свидетельствуют э, в пользу версии, что Соки он был убит. Вот э, Вадим ссылался, но я зачту, вот он, копия рапорта следователя Преображенского управления милиции Левина от 19 ноября 2009 года. Он сходил в СИЗО, он первый расследовал, он написал, принимая во внимание, что при проведении проверки могут усматриваться данные, указывающие на признаки преступления, 
предусмотренной статьей 105, 105 это убийство, 4 статья, полагал бы данный рапорт зарегистрировать в КРСП, это книга регистрации совершенных преступлений, и провести проверку в порядке 144. Здесь есть всякие подписи, рапорт этот зарегистрирован в книге регистрации совершенных преступлений. Вадим упоминал акт о смерти, вот копия акта о смерти. Да, здесь указана закрытая черепная мозговая травма. Да, вот копия э, э, акта применения наручников. Здесь написано, была применена резиновая палка, даже подчеркнута, в отношении подозреваемого. То есть насилие было применено. И э, э, версия э, о том, что он был убит, разумеется, э, э, имеет убедительные аргументы. Здесь очень важно свидетельство э, э, врача э, Корнилова, врача скорой помощи. Это очень интересный случай, поскольку скорая помощь – это закрытая такая государственная структура. Э, э, она, э, так сказать, не, не очень просто было туда пройти, и мне сначала не дали фамилию врача, но сказали, вы оставьте свой телефон, если врач захочет, он позвонит вам. И он позвонил. Он позвонил, врач Корнилов, и вот что он сказал. Он сказал, что они приехали, их целый час не пускали в бутырку. Они простояли у входа. А потом пустили, но пустили, когда уже он был мертв. Они зашли а, матросская тишина, конечно, да, 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 простите, матросская тишина, да, пропустили, они зашли в камеру 4 сборного отделения и увидели лежащего на полу Магнитского, под ним была лужа мочи, рядом валялись наручники, а в официальной версии ведь как сказано? Сказано, что он умер в палате интенсивной терапии, что ему делали э, искусственное дыхание и э, как-то пытались спасти. Ничего подобного. Вот он был э, мертв, э, э, они нашли его мертвым, и они позвонили в скорую помощь, сообщили об этом факте, этот факт зарегистрирован. Он э, э, показывает, что смерть зарегистрирована на час раньше, чем э, э, обычные э, свидетельства, э, э, официальные свидетельства. То есть э, э, ложь официальная, была совершенно откровенная. И когда вот мы пришли, разговаривали с врачом Гаус, который принял его в сборном отделении, и когда мы выясняли, почему же она его заковала в наручники, отправила в эту бригаду 8 человек, она сказала, он поднял кушетку, стал ею размахивать. Я говорю, простите. Как он мог поднять кушетку, которая, во-первых, должна быть закоплена к полу, и она не может быть свободной. Во-вторых, клетка, в которой он находился диаметром 0,7 сантиметров, размахивать двухметровой кушеткой невозможно. И уж... И э, ложь была и со стороны начальника ДПНЦ э, Федорова, который, собственно, э, вот, в числе этих восьми охранников его избивал. Да, его избивали. Да, смерть наступила в результате физического насилия. И э, э, свидетельства э, э, об этом, по-моему, очевидны. Э, 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 тут надо сказать, что когда шло... Расследование долгое время нам не отвечали на наше письмо, на наш акт. Мы разослали его во все инстанции, включая президента, вывесили в интернете. И потом я спросил у замгенпрокурора, когда же вы нам ответите? Он сказал, да, скоро ответим. И действительно, акт нашей комиссии приобщили к расследованию, к делу которое завел Следственный комитет. Следственный комитет вначале, как мне показалось, действительно был заинтересован расследовать дело. Я даже спрашивал Бастрыкина, главу Следственного комитета, что вы берете второстепенных лиц, Кратова и Литвинова, когда, в общем-то, виновны другие в смерти Магнитского. Он говорит, ничего, ничего, это только начало. Вот. Был ли он искренне лгал, не знаю, но во всяком случае... 
Такое продолжалось недолго. Смерти Магнитского действительно есть вещи, которые даже сама следователь Ломоносова не могла обнаружить. Ну, например, видеозапись, как его привезли в матросскую тишину. Видеозапись, как он уезжал из бутырки, мы видели. Это был здоровый человек. Он носил э, тюки, э, сумки, э, грузил машину и не производил впечатление э, э, того психоза, о котором говорила Гаус. А вот как он прибыл э, в матросскую тишину, э, э, эта видеозапись исчезла. Исчезла, и она не была даже в материалах Следственного комитета. Что под, по, позволяет предположить, что, в общем-то, или его избивали в машине, что вполне возможно, или потому что Гаус и говорила, что вот он прятался так за лист бумаги, говорил, что меня хотят убить и так далее, и так далее. Скрыты, скрыты эти видеозаписи. Я думаю, что тут важно отметить, что Магнитского содержали в камерах пыточных. Это откровенно пыточные камеры в Бутырской тюрьме. Они внизу расположены. Там были камеры и без окон. Там и была камера, где нечистоты из туалета выливались. Вот. Потом эти камеры унич... разрушили, уничтожили. Начальник тюрьмы, новый э, Телятников Сергей Анинович, так с гордостью показывал нам, что вот этих камер больше нету. То есть они признавали, что это позорный факт. Позорный факт существования таких пыточных камер. Вот. Но а то, что э, Магнитскому э, демонстративно отказывали э, в лечении, есть, например, э, отказ э, следователя Сильченко, э, э, когда его запросили врачи матросской тишины направить э, на плановую операцию, он выразил протест. Он э, заявил, что он э, этого не допускает. Кстати, его перевели из матросской тишины, где была больница, в бутырку за неделю до э, проведения плановой э, операции. То есть намеренное создание условий которые приводили к ухудшению состояния здоровья, которые приводили, ну и в общем-то, потому что вывезли его из бутырки, как говорила Литвинова, врач, она была в панике, в каком состоянии он был, и надо его срочно выводить. То есть условия содержания были откровенно пыточные. И поэтому когда господин Некрасов говорит, что вот он не думает, и что вообще там камеры там были э, на, на, на обычные условия, он, нет, он был не в обычных условиях. Он был в тех условиях, э, да, в этих камерах были и другие, э, верно, но они специальные, эти камеры были созданы для тех людей, которые подвергались спыткам. Это были пыточные камеры. Yes, thank you very much. I will go back to you, Mr. Nakrasov. And, and uh, uh, there are a lot of details here, but I mean, uh, the, main, uh, the main story is that three companies were stolen. Officials were involved in that. Mr. Magnitsky was pr imprisoned and tortured because he was a whistleblower in that case, and it was done to protect uh, the wish officials. And, and you, you, are, uh, you are arguing against that story. And what, what are the main weaknesses according to your <coughs> investigation of that story? Well, uh, what I'm saying is, again, it's a circular argument. You're, you're saying that uh, he was, he investigated that story and the officials were involved, but I, we don't know. But you, you see, the problem is that we, uh, the, the, the separation between, let's say, this kind of, uh, a, 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 a Mr. Magnitsky, a Western business hermitage, you know, and a, a Russian sort of officials and Russian state is completely artificial. It's completely uh, sort of, it's, it's in the perception of people who don't know Russia, who, who don't know the case. The, uh, the hermitage worked in Russia for 10 years. And as far as I'm concerned, there, there's a, a 
uh, indications and in suspicions that it actually w worked in a, in, a, in a way every Russian business works. You know, having contacts with the police, you know, uh, tax officials, and whatever. We're not, uh, you know, this, as I said, this is a very long story, but I'm just indicating the, the directions of logic. You know, you, ca you cannot just uh, presume automatically that, uh, that if, 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 if Hermitage or um, uh, Mr. Magnitsky uh, does or does not something, he is a kind of, by definition, it out of that system, and, and Hermitage as well. And, uh, let, let me just be specific. Yeah, please. Let, let, let's just ask, with, because the problem is that I'm, I'm here alone, you know, we against, uh, uh, against 20 people. And I, I, as I said, I... I reject not even the facts uh, the, of Mr. Browder's, the, uh, Mr. Browder's version. I, I, re I reject what they uh, purport I'm saying. For example, uh, uh, Olesya said, I kind of condone uh, of, uh, the, the conditions of the Russian prison. I, I, I filmed in a Russian prison, and I constantly, um, you know, I constantly condemn the, 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 the Russian system, the Russian culture, of brutalities, specific facts. Uh, I defend human rights, etc. What we're talking about, and, and, and Mr. Borshev said, you know, um, I sort of, I have this opinion that Russian prisons are okay. Let's be very specific. Andres Gross, Andres Gross, whose, whose report you've, you've attached here, yeah? told me on camera very clearly Magnitsky wasn't killed. Magnitsky, did you see the film? Did you see? You're criticizing me. How about watching the film? This, you, you're spreading the lies about my film, not about, uh, you know, the, which is uh, kind of about the facts of the Magnitsky case. Uh, Andreas Gross said that Magnitsky wasn't killed, whom you kind of quote. Uh, physicians for human rights, American doctors, who were hired as far as I'm concerned by this group, did not say he was killed. They said, M Magnitsky's mother told me on the direct question, who is to blame for your son's uh, death? He said, doctors, doctors, doctors' negligence. You know, what are you talking about? Magnitsky was, was uh, kept in an elite block of Matroska Tishina prison called elite block. He was, I do say in the film, very clearly, that he did complain when he was transferred to Buturka. But in Magn Matroska Tishina, and Mr. Browder is telling us, he was tortured every single day for one year. Mr. Browder, every single day was he tortured. He was in an elite block, higher quality, uh, where, by the way, Tycoon Khodorkovsky was kept, whom, whose arrest Mr. Browder, at, at, you know, at, at a time when he was arrested, condoned. He called uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky a thief. But uh, nevertheless, he was kept in, a, in, a, in a relatively good conditions. And that's the place where Mr. Magnitsky was... was to, but, but the important point is that, logically, I was... I was, I was you know, democracy is, 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 is you know, based not only in emotions, not only on... on on, 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 on very often correct statements that some countries are worse, kind of have worse uh, human rights records than Norway. I totally agree with that. Democracy is based on ability to argue. You know, S scholars taught us democracy. You know, logic. The logic is not emotions, emotions aside, and I, 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 I repeat, I condemn the Russian culture of brutality. But the logic is that pure mathematical logic, that even Magni if Magnitsky was killed, which, I, I, which Andreas Gross and others say he wasn't, but even if he was killed, it has no logical connection to the white collar crime I'm trying, I, I've been trying to investigate in my film. Yes, thank you very much. But that thank was you. Clear. And, and, uh, just to follow up from another angle, is it is your approach that this is it's a, the it's companies a, were stolen and there's no yeah. evidence they were they were stolen basically yeah. that's but, my argument yeah and it's a very long story but it's a question about who stole it yeah but they were not oh, your well questions. I I didn't I, I don't know I'm not saying I'm the Mr by the way Mr Browder claims I claim he stole the money I never said that that's another that's another that's ironically that's an, that's another that's another misconception I never claimed that the, the, these groups stole, stole the money I'm just saying their story their story doesn't stand their explanation how they lost control of these companies that is not true 
that's all. That's all. Okay. And they, 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 they have to tell another yeah. intelligence story. Then I might believe them, but, but it's not true. They did but, not control, lost control. What the arguments were they used are not, are, are just are not valid. Just to sum up, I mean, your, your approach, about, that's all. Is, is it correct to say that your approach is not that, it's not unthinkable that this could happen in what? Russia? This of course, but is this, yeah. is, is this a proof? So it's, of it's course. a con concrete, of course they're radar concrete assessment of the documents. They're, they're, they're radar attacks, but, but as, again, as I say in the film, the radar attack, it's again, that you know, you use a pl this plausible, Mr. Browder and, you know, I didn't Klein are very good at, at taking some plausible things, as, as usually people do, in, 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 in what in police calls diversionary, diversionary tactics, you know, preventive diversionary tactics. You, 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 you create a plausible story and then, you know, uh, but the, the, it's plausible. But but radar attacks happen in Russia. It happened more than at the time. It's correct. But they happen when they want when the criminals want hand, get get hold of, you know, property, something real, uh, factories or, or or real estate. In this case, the the, the concept is is used is is used inaccurately. You know, in, as far as I'm concerned, in sort of um, in, in, to, to divert attention, to, uh, red herring. Uh, fallacy from 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 the real story, but uh, th th there's no evidence that uh, that uh, Mr. Browder and company lost control of those companies. Okay. There's no evidence. There's no evidence that's of that. That's no, okay, so that, that's, that's the allegation. There's no evidence yep, of that. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, Mr. Klein, you will soon get the word. But uh, Olivia Schmagen, uh, what is your uh, view on the uh, plausibility or the where is it plausible the 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 Magnitsky campaign's story? about the stealing of the companies. Is it plausible? Uh, sorry, I, I'm again will speak in Russian. Uh, ну вот, Андрей, когда вы говорите, что здесь там 20 человек сидит против вас, это ну, не совсем корректно, потому что, в общем, мы здесь собрались, чтобы обсудить факты, да, не, ну, не, не, не вас, и как бы, ну, вы имеете право на свое мнение, но Да, действительно, мне кажется, что факты, которые приведены в вашем фильме, они некорректны. И еще, когда вы говорите, что здесь все там, сторонники господина Браудера или фонда Эрмитаж, это тоже не совсем правильно, да, потому что как бы мы не... Мы не... Когда не... Ну вот я как журналист, да, в своей работе, мы не основываемся на словах какой-то стороны. Мы смотрим на документы, которые конкретная сторона может предоставить. Дальше, естественно, мы слушаем версию, смотрим документы, пытаемся там, выцепить да, рациональное зерно. Мы всегда общаемся с двумя сторонами. Мы общались с Андреем Алексеевичем Павловым, мы, стараемся общ... мы общались с Клюевым. То есть мы не берем некую версию за правду, мы анализируем и на основе документов, которые могут предоставить разные стороны, на основе их слов мы пишем наши публикации. Что касается того, было ли хищение из бюджета с помощью трех компаний, ну этот факт, этот факт никто действительно не отрицает, оно не просто возможно, оно the question was whether вопрос был потерял ли вы считаете ли вы убедительным доказанным что группа Эрмитаж потеряла контроль над этим вот это мой тезис я поняла да это это очень важно не доказано хорошо это очень важный тезис и ну тут опять же можно смотреть на документы и на свидетельства да ну то есть документальные и мы видим что Еще до того, как э, из бюджета были украдены средства с помощью этих трех компаний, э, фонд «Эрмитаж», э, различные его представители сообщили о том, что они потеряли контроль над этими компаниями. Если предполагать, следуя вашей логике, что э, они не потеряли контроль и, видимо, пытались сами возвратить эти налоги и только притворялись, Тогда зачем же они сообщили полиции о том, что их компании украдены и потребовали провести расследование и, соответственно, вернуть им эти компании? Это, Это подождите, я просто а, как бы пытаюсь показать, ну то есть на мой взгляд эту логику не выдерживает критики, потому что если ты хочешь украсть что-то, ты не привлекаешь внимание правоохранительных органов перед тем, как ты это сделаешь. 
Well, can I repeat it very, very quickly in, in, in Russian, English? Okay. Uh, just, I think just, just just one, more one, one more. We'll come back to you, Mr. Okay. Nakaso. So right. just, uh, you, uh, Mr. Kleiner, uh, the allegation is that uh, the, the story that the three companies were stolen and used to, to, uh, to get an illegal tax refund is not correct. And, and uh, how do you uh, explain to us the, the background of that, background of that uh, case and, and how do you document it? Okay, so the issue is the following. It's not true and ab absolutely um, proven by the document uh, that the companies were stolen. They, they were registered to members of the criminal group, uh, specifically uh, the Russian uh, named uh, Mr. Markelov, who was involved in previous crimes with the same criminal group and it was not uh, his first crime together. And uh, second, as uh, properly was mentioned, uh, as soon as all the evidence were collected, they were presented in a criminal complaint, and we have all the evidence that uh, already in the early December 2007, the authorities had all these complaints in place. I have in front of me the documents which shows the movement of these complaints inside, inside, inside the uh, prosecutor office, investigation committee, and so on. So would they be interested in stopping this uh, crime? It would, be, it would happen easily, especially given the uh, following fact. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the fund was one of the biggest uh, in Russia, uh, and it was a joint venture with, uh, Hermit, uh, with the HSBC, the biggest European and British bank. Uh, and uh, over a sudden, the three companies belong to the fund being stolen and registered to three convicted criminals. So people, each of them, had at least two, between two and three convictions before, mm. which tells you something uh, very sane. So the whole story uh, that uh, Mr. Nikrasov is referring to, that there was some checks inside the tax office about the validity of tax refund is just a joke. Any check immediately would show that there is no underlying contracts which resulted in the losses uh, with these companies because the counterparties were empty companies which didn't have any business. And usually in Russia as well as in any other country, if you are asking for tax rebate, immediately, that, especially if it's like mean, it's any meaningless amount, like more than $5,000, not $230 million, they're making audit, either so-called short audit, audit in camera, or uh, and audit of counterparties because they are referring to counterparties or the full audit. Either of this audit immediately would show up all type of red flags, i.e. contracts with the shell companies which didn't do any business and so all, all con contracts are shame. Second, the people who were just prior to that uh, appointed as a directors are convicted criminals and they are asking for tax rebate for 230 million and many, many other facts which were actually part of this complaint which was uh, filed in December 2007. It was 250 pages of documents proving the fact that uh, all this was a shame. And then a short comment by Ms. Nakrasov and then my, my colleagues at the panel will, will take this forward to quest further questions. But uh, a short comment to that, Ms. Nakrasov. Yeah, okay. Well, as I said, there's a system in place in Russia a corrupt country, you know, I, I agree that it's a corrupt country. My point is that anybody who works there, especially works there for 10 years, is integrated in, in that system. That's the point. When, th this is, th this is a, again, a typical red herring uh, uh, discussion. Mr. Klein explains us to us how the Russian corrupt system works. The, the mechanism, it doesn't mean they did not lose control. Because when I talk about, I, I talk about direct, direct evidence, not the way, you know, theoretically, I'm not saying that, theoretically, whoever, if I'm not talking about them, like X, when he claims as a diversion tactic, by the way, you know, this happens all the time. I, I kill my wife and I'm the first one to go and report on it. You know, there's plenty of cases like this. It's because diversionary uh, t tactic. Just, just, for, just for the rec, just for the, to explain to you. Mm -hmm. the, again, this is not a proof. There's, there's, there's hard evidence you have to look, look at. So, uh, 
the, the, the hard evidence is that, the, the, you know, again, another, another point, that those, uh, the um, figurehead directors who, who took over were convicted criminals. It doesn't matter. Before, the, the, the apropos, uh, you know, our fight with, with the uh, offshore culture, all these companies are offshore shell companies. They are not owned directly. You know? That's why, by the way, the Russian court never convicted. We, we were talking about this very, very corrupt country. It never convicted Mr. Browd of this crime. Or, you know, because they don't have a proof. They convicted him of something else, where Mr. Browder was the director, and that was his signature. They, they can't prove, they maybe would like to, but they can't prove in this case that, that, he, that, he, that he controlled it. But there's, but there's a, lot of, a lot of very, very kind of uh, important evidence. When the, the court cases, which actually resulted in this tax refund, started, you know, they started in, in the summer, you know, this complaint, which is, by the way, again, Olesha, is not about the company theft. You won't find a name. You know, you say they, they complained about company theft. That's nothing. It, this is a complaint about money stolen from them. And I show in the film that Mr. Browder, Mr. Browder can't, even, can't even explain whether they had, had money or not. But they complain. And in this complaint, it, it's a straight, uh, it, it says, the money was stolen, theft of money, theft of, no, not theft of companies, it's a rather red herring thing, okay? So, but, but the court cases were, which couldn't have gone ahead without, uh, without informing them, without uh, notifying them by post, by registered post, they couldn't have gone ahead and they went ahead. There were so many court cases from, uh, through, from the summer to, 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 to December when they finally did this move. You know, and, and not about companies, but about something else, I think, to divert attention. But, but the, so, and Magnitsky, at some point, they had to admit that they received something from the court because, because it was sent to the correct address. So there was some paperwork that was sent to the correct address, to the correct address of their companies. So the, in October, then they did admit. And even if you say they only found out in October, they should have found out earlier. But even if you believe them, they did nothing between October and, 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 and almost you know, the, uh, and, uh, mid-December. Mid so there are all these questions. You know, and uh, you know, so so all those convicted criminals. Again, it's a psychological argument. It's uh, there's a long chain of those figureheads. You know, before there were some English, as I say in the film, it's also very important because it, pre prejudice, prejudice against Russia is very. It's, it's at work here. Before it was a figurehead from from Guernsey, you know, a professional figurehead who who kind of operates in this very murky system, which we I think we all disagree with because it's it's a, you know it's about tax evasion. We, 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 we hear now about Panama Papers, or we hear about Paradise Papers. So there's a well-dressed English gentleman as a figurehead, and then it's transferred to some sort of down and out. It changes nothing in principle. Thank you. Thank you. Then I think we move on to Brynja and uh, Gro for some uh, further questions, please. Yeah. Um, is my mic on? Yeah. Um, I won't take much of your time. And... Um, I, and I do understand that Nikrasov feel a bit outnumbered there at the panel, but I don't think one should exaggerate the the volume of bias here at the panel or in the audience. And and I think one of the reasons for that is what the chair said in the beginning: we don't really know that much about the case in order to have any prejudice and uh, or be biased. And we're here to learn. And, and I hope that everyone in this panel and every other panel use the opportunity to 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 make their voice heard in this panel. Um, I was thinking while you were speaking if there is some common ground here and at least there seemed to be some agreement about that there were irregular irregularities about this tax rebate. Either it was particularly big or it went particularly fast or so if you could say something about that where there might be common ground uh, and that's uh, to all of you actually. And then what might be interesting which hasn't been commented in is the money trail. I mean. I guess important evidence would be here what happened to the money afterwards, this $230 million. So if you can comment on that, that as well. Uh, my last question goes to, I do understand that Mr. Nekrasov and probably other people also 
would want sort of a grand hearing about this, a grand judgment where where you have months and months of evidence and where you can come to a final conclusion of this case. And and th at least this hearing is, is a very small uh, contribution to that. And we will never get into the sort of nitty-gritty of the details. And, and most of the things that you say, we, we won't be able to understand. But I was wondering, because there is a case before the, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which was originally filed by Magnitsky himself, I understand. And then there has been a new file after his death. And it has been communicated to, to Russia. Uh, so it will be a, a case that will be handled by the court. And I was wondering if you have an update on how that court case will be going and what are your expectations to all of you? Would that be sort of a more neutral, more formal handling of the case? And, and would you trust uh, the European court's conclusions when they finally arrive? So this is this is all of you. Limited questions uh, asked, to, uh, actually raised with the European Union Court, and uh, it's actually about deprivation of life and responsibility uh, of state for that. Uh, as far as we understand, it was not only communicated; it's actually uh, went up uh, fully up to the final stage, i.e., issuing the decision. So all the parties been heard. Uh, and uh, all the evidence were provided. So now it's pending the decision only. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we cannot pre prejudice and say what the decision will be. And of course, it will not give a, uh, answers to all questions because the questions which were, uh, which were raised are very limited. Well, exactly. I will, I, of course, I welcome any, any court and, and a proper hearing. You know, and you're absolutely right. It's, it, you know, this is only a small, uh, very small. Uh, contribution, uh, but uh, the I have to say that uh, you know it's often often said, and there will be a, I don't know whether there'll be more more talk about money tracing. Uh, with, with fairness, yeah, I don't want to kind of uh, have a screaming uh, match with uh, uh, my opponents, but but uh, you see, it's often said that uh, um, uh, money was found traced. Uh, that uh, you know, the, the, there's an investigation in, in you know 11 countries or 12 countries, whatever. But again, and, and let's wait. By the way, and uh, uh, um, uh, Vadim is right. It's, it's a limited. It's a limited issue they can discuss. Again, it's not going to be. And if you if you know if you follow my argument, unfortunately, that will not tell us the truth about the, the white-collar crime, because it's about Magnitsky's death. Mm. Okay, so, uh, but you have to remember that all this mention of the uh, investigations, of application, court applications, fine, there hasn't been any, any one conviction in, in the money uh, uh, tracing thing. Uh, how, how did uh, the, the most famous case, of course, it's the American case against Previson. It's caused a lot of publicity. You see the depositions in my film. You see, by the way, uh, the deposition, not just of Mr. Browder, but very importantly, of the uh, homeland uh, uh, security agent who scandalously says, and, and, and a, a head agent who was investigating, and, and, and uh, Hermitage is, often says, look, the uh, Department of Justice con conducted this investigation. American government did this. Well, you saw, you saw the agent of the American government saying he got all information from Browder. Even the American government, not just some Andreas Gross gets it from. He said it very, very that, clearly. So, so we have to wait for actual conviction. We have to wait for actual court case, because in that case, as far as I know, Mr. Browder physically went to the, to the uh, prosecutor of Southern District of New York, the uh, attorney, and delivered this. Fine. It's, it's a great PR. Uh, you know, people, uh, press will write it. But where's the conviction? And when it did come to court, when it did come to court, the government settled. The government settled. As you know, if, if the government, Mr. Browder, had a real case, a real case, you know, would have, would have they settled? Would, they, they would have gone to trial. They would have showed those corrupt, corrupt Russians. The, 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 the whole case would have, been, would have been up in the press with all these details. Then, would, then would, 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 would know. But no, they settled with no guilt admitted. So when it comes to court, there's no proof. Thank you. Very short, but then, yeah, very short. Uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Dikrasov again playing with the truth. 
but uh, just to address some of his points, uh, just coming backwards uh, to where he uh, did it. So the complaint was filed back in 2000, uh, in December 2007, and the criminal case was opened uh, uh, on the 5th of uh, February 2008, which directly says uh, that based on the fake uh, documents, a change was made in register of unified registry of legal entities, uh, and where the company named Pluton became the participants and in place of HSBC managers Paul Rich and uh, 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 Martin Wilson, the following uh, uh, directors were appointed. So it's not only that the complaint was filed, it was well regarded and the authorities understood what was it about. And, 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 and they opened the criminal case. So they opened but the result. The result is yes. in the autumn. Okay. No, uh, the result, uh, it, it could be maybe commented better by Alicia because the investigator who uh, happened to hand, uh, hand over this case to uh, happened to be a friend, closest friend and subordinate of the major criminal behind the case. That's okay. Okay. But, uh, and, and, uh, and this is happening with all the facts which, uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Nikrasov is trying to uh, provide. For example, the settlement itself is already built. And if you look at the uh, U.S. authorities, this is what they're doing for uh, day in and day out. They're settling the case. It's very rare when they put in especially uh, these financial cases uh, to any final uh, judgment. For them, is uh, to make the lesson is the main the main target. And this is yeah, what no admission and, of guilt. And, 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 no admission of guilt. So yeah, of course, no, we heard that. Yeah, and, uh, of course, no admission of guilt because uh, last week the U.S. government made it public all negotiations with the other party about the settlement. So you could see all the negotiations about admission of guilt. But the people who received this money, just, uh, I finish one sentence. They settled this case here with US government. Uh, 15 years ago, they did the same in the money laundering case in uh, Israel. And currently they are under money laundering investigation in two other countries, i.e. Switzerland, and Netherlands. But, but I, you, I also you, have to take care you of yourself panelists. said they're not part of the criminal group. Okay. It's, it's in the deposition. Thank you. You know, you just... <laughs> yeah, so the, not the, only the court. You, you, you yourself said he, he did, has nothing to do with the Thank you. crime. Thank, uh, you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Grosso. So, so there's lots of issues to, to speak. But uh, I also take care of my, my panel. So do we have a, also a question to the panel uh, yeah. before we open the floor? Just to follow, <coughs> follow up from uh, what Pirin, you've said. Uh, we are here to learn. So, um, um, you know, <clears throat> the Magnisti case has become a symbol of uh, corruption, abuse of power, leading to uh, violations of human rights. So, what is the lessons learned in terms of, you know, protection of whistleblowers um, and corruption, and in that context, and specifically the money trail? We have uh, touched upon it, but, you know, to start from the other end, where is the money today? Where is the 230 million? Maybe I will start with this, but especially maybe given Maybe Mr. Pominov could take yeah. that first. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Pominov first on the uh, lessons learned for, for TR Russia especially? Uh, yeah. On the other hand, the lesson here is very important. The first, probably, is what is it? If the gentlemen who are now leading the company о правосудии за Сергея Магнитского не сделали эту компанию, то, в общем-то, надо признаться, что этот кейс утонул бы так же, как и множество остальных кейсов. И вообще то, что мы обсуждаем сегодня, это большая заслуга тех организаций и людей, которые, ну, у которых нашлось время, ресурсы, желание этим кейсом заниматься, а не просто, ну, как бы оставить его незамеченным. Вот, это, значит, первое. Второе, мне кажется, очень важный урок, что действительно мы вот таким публичным слушанием, причем не только мы, значит, и в европейских структурах, и в парламентах разных стран, мы обсуждаем, на самом деле, ну, более-менее одну и ту же ситуацию, вот, которая по-хорошему-то должна бы обсуждаться в суде, да вот проблема, нету, ну, такого суда, где это могло бы честно и непредвзято обсуждаться, потому что, ну, то есть, вот какой вывод был тогда у комиссии э, это самое, Совета при Президенте, что 
это самое, что следовать, ну, что не, не, невозможно даже следователей по делу независимых назначить, что там все время одни и те же следователи. Вот просто не взяли внешних людей, чтобы избежать конфликта интересов. Вот это, ну, это факт, который как бы, ну, вот он есть. То есть люди либо одни и те же, либо там связаны друг с другом, подчиненных своих назначают, да? Вот, то есть с этим как бы никто не спорит. Да, такой вывод комиссия сделала. Поэтому, поэтому ну, не получается пока значит, организовать суд по этому случаю. И по, я думаю, мы сегодня будем потом обсуждать множество других случаев из разных стран. Вот, что это ну, не какой-то единственный уникальный, вот, а вообще эта штука довольно распространенная. Вот, и я сейчас передам слово Вадиму. Наверное, поговорить про те деньги, которые были выведены. Вот, опять же, ну, представляете себе человека, который украл, неважно даже сейчас кто это, много миллионов долларов. Естественно, он ну, какую-то часть этих денег отдаст для того, чтобы запутать следы и, и сделать так, чтобы эти деньги никогда не были найдены. Благо финансовых инструментов для этого сейчас очень много во всем мире, хоть и становится в какой-то степени меньше, но а, нанимаются очень дорогие юридические фирмы, а, следы запутываются в юрисдикциях, где нет открытых реестров, где мы не можем посмотреть собственников компании. Да, и поэтому, естественно, всегда отслеживание денег, Олеся не даст соврать, это большая проблема, но тем не менее, кое-какие, э, скажем, подозрения, и я сейчас не буду... Ну, как бы, э, как это сказать, э, не буду брать на себя роль какого-то судьи, да, вот, но, э, значит, вот что мы знаем, несколько таких коротких вещей, а в том числе об этом писал Алексей Навальный, вот, и, и, и журналисты, я думаю, Вадим дополнит меня, вот, э, есть серьезные основания и документы, э, например, из э, Объединенных Арабских Эмиратов, которые и документы о перемещ... свидетельствующие о перемещениях э, лиц, которые э, замешаны в этом деле, в частности вот этих следователей, которые э, позволяют нам утверждать или во всяком случае выдвигать в отношении них э, серьезные предположения о том, что они живут не посредством. То есть э, э, какая бы, какой бы там важный и высокооплачиваемый ни был следователь, даже начальник управления или начальник налоговой службы, я думаю, даже норвежский начальник налоговой службы не может себе позволить многомиллионные дома где-то в Объединенных Арабских Эмиратах, там какие-то частные самолеты. Вот, значит, ну, ну, не говоря уже про российского чиновника. Вот, тем не менее, есть серьезные основания и документы, которые подтверждают, что и начальники вот этих налоговых, 25, 26, да, вот, и 28, 28 да, вот, значит, и, и эти следователи, их расходы существенно превышают их доходы, которые они резонным, э, как это, резонably, разумным образом э, могли бы обосновать, даже, даже если бы они работали э, всю жизнь в трех поколениях. Вот, э, пожалуйста. I'm sorry, I need to take control of this now because we are running out of time. And, and uh, what we'll do now, we'll open up for a couple of questions and uh, all of the participants will have two minutes uh, at the end and then include your observations or answers to the questions in that round, please. And, and I'm sorry about that, but we need to, to get it into the time frames that we have. So, so you can come back to that. Uh, so uh, if there's any, there's a, there's a mic in the room, I think. So there's a question over here. And, and please, please be short. We want questions and, and uh, uh, only and short questions. Uh, my name is Aida Vermeising Sid. There are many authors of books and articles about this case. Where are these authors in this room? Also, where are representatives of Russian authorities? We also believe that 
uh, Browder was a key hand dealer of a huge CIA operation in Russia during the 1990s. Where are the security analysts? Without this, these, we can have no fair hearing in this room. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? There's a question over here. So. Elias Aslavsky, uh, Free Russia Foundation, question to Andrei Nikrasov. You said you are an uh, anti-Putin um, uh, activist, independent anti-corruption investigator. What are your exact relations uh, uh, with uh, Natalia Veselnitsky and Renata Ahmedshin, who have been shown by US media to have waged uh, a campaign against Magnitsky Act and have been exchanging uh, on all sorts of uh, levels with, uh, with Trump campaign? hired public relations and lobbyists to discredit uh, and to try to get uh, also set up uh, uh, artificial uh, NGO uh, which pretended to protect uh, Russian children. Um, and uh, as um, a lot of articles showed, uh, apparently you, uh, they, uh, were, uh, your film screening at museum in Washington was part of that campaign. So how that uh, relates to you being an independent anti-Putin activist. And second question, uh, there are allegations and uh, discussions in Washington that uh, you had uh, problems uh, with Hudson Institute uh, and David Setter in your previous film and there were accusations of uh, fraud uh, on your side uh, in terms of financial dealings with Hudson. And uh, that also that essentially before this film you were financially broke. I'm interested uh, in your direct comments on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? In uh, this uh, one question, this is the fire. Do we we'll be very short? We can take to these two questions. And that's the last ones. Um. Я хочу спросить мистера Браудера или Клайнера по поводу дела Александра Долженко, который, может быть, вам известно, буквально недавно этот человек в Калмыкии, регионе, про который здесь, наверное, мало кто знает, был посажен, приговорен к двум годам лишения свободы, что было связано с... Он, он, был рабо... он был управляющим дальней степи компании, про которую говорят, что она была связана с Хермидеш uh, Capital. В курсе ли вы этого дела, защищаете ли вы этого человека, считаете ли вы его тоже пострадавшим по политическим причинам? Спасибо. Артур Сакунс из Армении, Хельсинская гражданская ассамблея. У меня вопрос к господину Некрасову. Вот вы признаете то, что факт есть о мозговом травме, сожжем травме Магнитского? И это результат болезни или результат чего-то? И вот как ваша оценка, вот сам факта, она с вашей точки зрения является причиной смерти или нет? Хорошо? И я предлагаю другой вопрос. Знаете, если... Господин Браудер, вот вопрос э, Антону Паминову. Э, есть, конечно, вопросы коррупционных каких разных схем в наших коррупционных странах. Э, на самом деле, насколько западные компании в России э, входят в эти коррупционные системы и сотрудничают с российской коррупционной системой. Да? Потому что я не хочу, чтобы сейчас вопрос Магнитского путались с каким-то коррупционным... Это отдельное слушание. Человек умер, убили. Это не надо спутать с любыми криминальными вопросами. Потому что здесь всячески хотят перепутать. Если даже Магнитский сам ярый преступник, но все равно его убили. Тут вопрос в этом. Не надо его э, спутать с каким-то схемой. Но в всяком случае, вот насчет коррупционных схем, существующих сейчас в России, хотел бы вашей вот экспертной точки зрения. Спасибо. Okay, thank you for those questions. I think uh, the panel should address them as they feel uh, appropriate. And there were some concrete questions to Mr. Nakraso, and you will That's have an extra minute for that. Whatever order. But that uh, we will take the same order as, as last time. Uh, yeah, but I think we take note of the of the uh, criticism of the of the conference. But I don't think you should feel responsible for that. So that is something that we should take take note of, and, and the Helsinki committee should 
then uh, maybe respond to that, I don't know. But uh, you should not at least feel responsible for that. So, so please, uh, we'll start with uh, Olicia and, and uh, your final observations on the discussions here and, and uh, also, also observations on the questions if you feel that. Хорошо. На самом деле, один вопрос, мне кажется, я могу на него ответить, он касается Долженко как раз, потому что это тема, которая тоже, в общем, всплывала в том расследовании про Андрея Павлова, о котором я вначале рассказывала. Это довольно интересно, потому что это дело, которое появилось в 2015, по-моему, году. А, прошу прощения. Дело, которое появилось в 2015 году. Вот интересно, что адвокат Павлов обсуждал возможность появления такого дела в 2013 году. И он обсуждал его с британскими адвокатами как раз Карпова, который защищал свою честь и достоинство в лондонском суде. И там был, была такая фраза, как вы считаете, поможет ли делу о защите и репутации Карпова, если в России появится новый уголовный процесс, который будет, в общем, говорить о том, что банкротство дальней степи было преднамеренным. Ну и там вот в нескольких словах было, так сказать, накидано да, то, что потом было действительно реализовано как уголовное дело против Долженко. Я разговаривала с адвокатом Долженко, который говорил, что на первом допросе ему сказали, послушай, вот ты, у тебя там, у него какая-то, ну, серьезное заболевание, тебе в тюрьме будет очень плохо, тебе будет очень плохо, ты же не хочешь оказаться в тюрьме. Вот нам сейчас нужны показания на э, Браудера, он враг России. Э, ну, я сейчас цитирую вот адвоката Долженко, ну, и надо понимать, да, адвокат Долженко действительно, ну, он заинтересован в том, что Долженко защищать, но вот э, как бы... Вот такие были его слова. Дай нам показания на э, Браудера, и, э, в общем, мы посадим тебя под домашний арест, а не в тюрьму, не в СИЗО, и ты там не умрешь, как Магнитский, условно. А, и, в общем, постараемся обеспечить тебе нормальные условия. И когда мы говорили с Андреем Алексеевичем Павловым, и прямо задали ему вопрос, ну, послушайте, интересно получается, в 2013 году э, вы говорите о том, что такое дело будет вам удобно, выгодно, а в 2015 году это дело на самом деле появляется. На что он сказал, что да, я искренне хотел, чтобы такое дело появилось, я использовал все свои связи для того, чтобы оно возникло. Оно возникло. Ну, то есть, как бы, речь опять о том, как человек может влиять на уголовные процессы и на процессуальные действия по уголовному делу. Вот, э, да, я очень коротко. Ну и что касается, если говорить про какое-то последнее заключение, мне кажется, опять же, я хотела бы подчеркнуть, что вот Андрей, э, я скорее, наверное, здесь была бы, ну то есть, наверное, как вы, я тоже могу назвать себя независимым журналистом, наверное, антипутинским не могу, потому что ну, мы стараемся быть независимыми, э, но мы занимаемся расследованием и коррупцией, преступности, да, но а, как бы я, честно, вот я вижу здесь господина Браудера первый раз и, в общем, скорее склонна не доверять его версии, но, опять же, если мы а, смотрим на документы, которые Вадим предоставляет а, журналистам, а, ну, как бы мы можем делать свои выводы, и мне кажется, что это некая порочная логика говорить о том, что… А, все доказательства косвенные. Но э, когда вы сидите в кафе и не смотрите за окно, но в кафе постоянно заходят люди с зонтиками, с мокрыми, вы же ну, можете предположить, что на улице идет дождь. Это косвенные доказательства, которые принимаются судами всех стран. В общем, особенно когда этих доказательств много, можно говорить о сумме косвенных доказательств. И э, никто не принял. Подождите. Да, да, да. Но как бы мы не суд и не следствие, но мы журналисты, которые занимаются расследованиями. И э, собирая доказательства, мы, видимо, ну, предоставляем их, да, и они чему-то, соответственно, ну, приходим, приходим к каким-то выводам. И вот эта логика говорить о том, что это косвенное доказательство, это косвенное доказательство, ну, она, на мой взгляд, порочная, потому что э, если игнорировать косвенные доказательства, ну, как бы, то у вас не будет никакого вывода. Да. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. We will, uh, I will ask you to be very, very, very short. Mr. Nekrasov, please, you will get the word soon. Uh, you ask you to be very short in your, in your final comments. We are actually uh, out of time now, so you are you have to think that you are denying people's coffee. Uh, but we give you a, a, a few minutes more in order to conclude this in a, in a, in a, in a decent way. So, please, but, but uh, Mr. Pominov, if you have yeah, so some final observations and then we go down the road. We go down to the panel, please. Um, Very short, if you have some observations about uh, the mega uh, 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 case. Давайте я коротко, коротко отвечу на ваш вопрос. Значит, во-первых, связь нарушения прав человека и коррупции, да, вы говорите, что не, не зависит это от, так сказать, того, коррупция, не коррупция, на самом деле зависит, потому что, ну, собственно, из, вот эта смерть человека как раз произошла, ну, не, не из кровожадности каких-то людей, ну, в смысле, не только из кровожадности, людей, а как раз ровно из-за того, что кто-то куда-то увел миллиарды, как мы считаем. Это первое. Второе, как иностранный бизнес связан с государством, знаете, ну, по-разному связан, то есть в смысле, что есть определенные дела, ну, вот если мы откроем статистику дел по Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, закону о коррупционных практиках за рубежом э, США, то мы найдем ну, порядка там, дюжины или чуть больше дел, э, э, в, э, в которых иностранные компании как раз применяли settlement agreement с американским судом, э, ну, где как это, признавали вину в том, что подкупали ну, не только российских, на самом деле по всему миру и бразильских, там, и китайских, и каких только не чиновников. Вот, для того, чтобы достичь каких-то своих целей. Поэтому ну, здесь на самом деле никакой специфики вот у иностранных компаний нет. Мне кажется, намного интересней смотреть, и это часть там, нашей рабочей повестки, о том, как российский бизнес связан с российскими властями. Ну, в том смысле, что иностранный бизнес сильно попадает, ну, то есть для него Россия это только часть рынков, если... Ну, условно говоря, там бизнес как боится попасть под санкции, он просто перестает работать. Вот. А российский бизнес в России как работал, так и работает. И у нас есть ну, серьезные подозрения, что, ну, как бы, что он работает и, и как это, выделяет деньги на избирательные кампании, и выделяет деньги в так называемый бассейн да, для того, чтобы политики могли... А ну, принимать нужные им решения, в том числе и Путин, в том числе и Медведев, да, вот мы, он вам не Димон, если кто видел, из иностранцев, из расследования Алексея Навального, опубликованное вот раньше в этом году, вот, то мне кажется, что никакой специфики у иностранного бизнеса, ну, нету, и более того, я всегда еще говорю, вот здесь, когда бываю на конференции с бизнесом в мае или июне, которую проводят мои коллеги из Тяй Норвегии, я говорю, что в основном, если вы иностранный бизнес, который идет в Россию, скорее всего, с государством российским вы сталкиваться не будете, вы будете сталкиваться с какими-то региональными властями, там, муниципальными властями, вот, но не, ну не, с, как бы не с Путиным там, и Медведевым. Вот, а будете делать свой ну, просто бизнес и подкупать какого-нибудь начальника гаража там, или какого-то там зама губернатора, типа того. Ну вот, такой, наверное, ответ. Вот. Ну, что касается вот, ну, как бы подведения итогов, наверное, не буду уже отнимать время. Давайте коллегам передам слово. Спасибо. Okay, I'm answering questions of uh, Ilya Zaslavsky. Okay, there were two questions about uh, a very sort of hot topic of Natalia Veselnitskaya, Donald Trump Jr. Ahmetshin, yes. Uh, uh, whether I know them, I do know them. Uh, I have nothing to do with them on, in, on the level of uh, any activity. I know them, uh, I met them because I was uh, very interested in the Previzon case. And uh, I realized that uh, there the were also kind of, not, not in, well, I don't know about Ahmetshin, but uh, I met him with a group of lawyers, and uh, Natalia Veselnitska, a group of American lawyers. And I knew that they were digging into the, uh, this case independently of me. And uh, you saw, I don't know if you saw the film, but you saw the, the, the videos of the depositions which Mark Simrat and John Mosca uh, conducted. And so, of course, it was, of course, very interesting. I tried to contact Veselnitska myself, actually, 
mm, on the record for you, uh, for many months. And she refused to talk to me because she thought I was uh, making, a, as she said, pro browder film. Uh, she Googled me um, and uh, you know, saw the films I've, uh, I, I made, which are, are the proof. Uh, we, you, you kind of sound question whether I'm still a critic of the Russian government. I think you have to look at my films. You have to look at the scene of, with Litvinenko when I got a fair share of, of contamination by polonium, grabbing the metal uh, objects in, the, in his uh, ward in the University College Hospital in London. So that is the real proof. Then uh, the, uh, the uh, Hudson Institute. Well, I can say on the record, there, uh, maybe not Hudson, I don't know about Hudson, but certainly David Satter is involved in the fraud against me. And they lost the case in court. And finished court. Um, and they owe me money. They stole my copyright. They uh, set up some sort of case in New York, which is, you know, we, we hear more and more scandals from America, the supposed rule of law country. They didn't inform me, I think on purpose, of the court case, because, because I would have easily, easily destroyed them in court because they stole my copyright, they didn't pay me, I worked for free for years, they slandered me in the press, the, you know, the gutter, gutter press, Daily Beast, gutter press, tabloid, I, find, I think, uh, need to round it off sl now. slandered me, slandered that. me, and did not publish my response about their lies. And so this is a kind of ad hominem, uh, Latin, a fallacy attack at me, completely unrelated, by the way, even if, even if I was wrong, it's a typical, typical slander. Uh, to 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 uh, character assassinate in this case as a proof that the whole the whole thing is is actually a sham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krasov. And uh, Mr. Kleiner. Thank okay, you. I'll try <coughs> to address the issues uh, which are left uh, outstanding. So first of all, the question about Mr. Daljenka. Uh, we feel obviously pity for this guy who became uh, another hostage of, of political prosecution of Bill Browder in all the cases which were. <laughs> Uh, open against uh, Mr. Browder after uh, Mr. Putin uh, direct remarks uh, and probably probably an order behind this scene. But we don't know anything about this guy because he showed up as some uh, appointed person by the tax authorities and we have nothing to say about him apart from the, f the fact that he became uh, another hostage in political prosecution. Uh, second thing which I would like to touch is the following. Uh, in this movie and in other arguments which are made uh, today uh, by Mr. Nikrasov, is he's referring to the early stages of investigation. So as you know, in, in the, during the investigation, you're collecting more and more documents. For example, there was a first report of Mr. Barshov, which uh, Mr. Nikrasov uh, prefers to refer to. But Mr. Barshov said that there was two years passed and there were many, many other documents collected and more conclusions were made about what happened with Sergei. The same issue with the re reference to the uh, deposition of Todd Hyman from U.S. whatever authorities who was investigating the case. Uh, the, in, uh, the testimony uh, took place in 2014. In 2017, there was 280,000 documents collected by U.S. authorities by depositing banks all around the world, by making eight uh, mutual legal assistance, by traveling and collecting documents all around the globe about this money laundering. So now I'm coming to the issue which is probably more interesting for you and other uh, um, uh, people in the auditorium about money laundering. So back in 2000, uh, uh, I believe 10, we filed a first complaint on money laundering with the help of whistleblower who helped us to identify the money received specifically by the person who authorized this uh, tax re uh, rebates. Uh, her name was uh, Olga Stepanova. She was head of uh, tax office number 28. And uh, we identified her money in Switzerland, and those money being frozen. And there is a criminal case about uh, this money, and we hope that it will be, uh, uh, end up with a result of confiscation of this illegal process. Russian uh, authorities declined to issue any, any accusation against this person, any accusation about uh, any person involved in, in this 
uh, in this illegal tax rebate. And as uh, journalists from Nova Gazeta, from Financial Times proved, the same exact group, the same Olga Stepanova, uh, authorized more than 20 billion rubles, i.e. 700 million dollars of illegal tax rebates during the course of starting from 2006 um, until 2010. Anyway, since that moment, we continue our investigation. We, with the help of uh, OCCRP, the uh, uh, Journalist Independent Investigation Group, which became known because of Panama Papers, we managed to identify a lot of this money. And uh, today, uh, on our request, it was open 11 criminal cases on money laundering in 11 countries. And it's only the beginning. And moreover, as we now know, and is again proven, and it's intersection with continued investigation of uh, journalists, it's a big laundromat. It's a big laundering machine. And even the companies which were in uh, involved in laundering the money which we are investigating both back of 2008 are, has intersection and connection to the companies which were involved in more recent money laundering. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now uh, closing, but I would like to, to let Mr. Borchev uh, mm -hmm. have the final word. And, and, and uh, what would be your, mm -hmm. your uh, most important takeaway from, from the Magnitsky mm -hmm. case that you want to communicate to this audience? Вывод такой, и тут я хотел бы возразить господину Некрасову, не врачи. Главные виновники, они исполнители, Кратов и Литвинов, они исполнители воли э, той организованной травли, той организованной кампании э, сломать э, э, Магнитского, может даже и убить, но насчет убить не буду утверждать, что это было плана, может это случ произошло случайно, но то, что сломать, э, это было сознательное э, э, действие. И э, я сказал, что руководитель Следственного комитета Бастрыкин, когда я им сказал, что вы второстепенных лиц используете от ничего ничего, потом мы перейдем к главному. Даже он согласился, что врачи э, второстепенные фигуры. Да. Матросская тишина 99, дробь 1, это федеральная тюрьма, мы там часто бывали, там неплохие условия, но его-то за неделю, за неделю до операции на Матросской тишине Прокопенко, начальник СИЗО, под видом того, что ему нужен э, э, ремонт, перевел бутырку. Так нет, вы говорите, что вот он сидел не только в матросской тишине, он сидел и в СИЗО-5, который очень плохой СИЗО, он и в ИВС сидел, он, он во многих ИВС, не надо ссылаться на матросскую тишину 99. Каждый день его пытали, каждый день. Да. Так вот, то, что если Прокопенко бы его не отправил, а не он отправил, конечно же, он получил указание, ему сделали бы вовремя операцию, Магнитский был бы жив. И э, поэтому э, это была целенаправленная кампания. Я даже скажу больше, вот э, Комнов, начальник э, СИЗО э, Бутырки, э, он настолько нервничал, и, и э, они, кстати, э, довольно грубо и неумело врали. Вот он подсунул журнал мне, журнал э, жалоб э, 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 заключенных, э, и говорит, и там нет ни одной жалобы Магнитского, а у меня в руках были копии. <смех> как же так? А журнал этот написан заново, одной ручкой, одной рукой, что, кстати, потом подтвердило и следствие. И э, э, Комнов сейчас э, ушел из э, уголовной исполнительной системы, он вдарился э, э, в церковную деятельность, его там защищает. Вот я все жду от него покаянное выступление, может быть это и случится, пос поскольку он сейчас член общественной наблюдательной комиссии города Москвы, и его включили так по абсурду нашему. Но... Все они, а Литвинова, которая рвалась сказать что-то нашей комиссии, ее взяли за плечи и увели от нас. Нет, не врачи были, главное. Это была целенаправленная кампания сломать Магнитского, заставить его выполнить волю следствия и убийство действительно на руках высокопоставленных лиц. I didn't, I didn't have my place. Uh, that, 
any answers questions. Please. Thank you very much. And that are is the final words. We have used much more time than we are allowed to. Okay. In, so, have, so in order to let everybody word. to speak, and yes. uh, now we need coffee. We will give you the 15 minutes of coffee that you uh, are entitled to. So please be back here in a quarter to 12.